are going to be facing an eviction epidemic here pretty soon. And Eleanor Goldfield, which is the article that I'm going to you know uh, read through here in, in a in a little bit. Uh, to talk about some of the key points uh, that she addresses. It's a, it's a fantastic article on Mint Press News. Uh, so you guys should go check that out if you if you would like to. I'm going to read read some of it here for you guys. But we are we are hitting that point where we're going to see a lot of evictions across the country. Um, 22 million households. That's households. Not 22 million people. We're talking about 22 million households, which at minimum is 88 million people. Minimum 88 million. If you're a house of four, right? It, households are usually families of four. Like a family of four, would be, that would mean 88 million people. Can't afford food in America because the pandemic has caused us to lose a lot of our livelihoods. Um you know, and it has put a lot of us at risk of losing our shelter, our food, our health, our water, all of our basic needs. All, again, going back to jobs, right? Going back to labor. This is why labor is so important uh, and why capitalists feel like they need to exploit it because labor has become the central focal point of how we get our basic needs met. Um, and when you can control labor then you can control basic needs and that's kind of the way that capitalism is working at this point uh even though basic needs uh, are should be a guarantee in our society and not something you have to fight for or quote earn uh which is how it is which is why 22 million households households in america cannot afford food uh now that is it is twice as bad for black and latino families than it is for white families because of systemic racism uh, because of the issues within, you know, th that are more specific to uh, through ethnic communities, through through minor to, to minority communities as well. Now, one out of six Americans can't afford rent, and once again, uh, it's the same thing, right? It's twice as bad for Black and Latino families because some of these landlords that are delivering evictions and going through with them are racist, uh, and we also have a racist criminal justice system because. Uh, the people that are 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 uh, enforcing the e evictions are sheriff's offices. So uh, you know, and and we all know that the cop, the police force, uh, the police system, the police organization, the police gang, whatever the fuck you want to call it, are racist. Uh, that is that is kind of not up for debate. That's just what it is. <laughs> uh, so what what do we do from here? Is you know, there there are eviction moratoriums, but there's a lot of problems within the eviction moratoriums. And we're going to talk about that. There's food programs in place, but there's a lot of problems with the food programs in place. And and the biggest way that you can kind of alleviate this problem, the biggest way that you can alleviate uh, the eviction epidemic that we are about to go into is pretty simple. You cancel rents. You cancel rents and mortgages, right? So so now even if you're a small business uh, or, or like a small time landlord, right? You only have one or two properties like th like this this place we live in is is um, owned by a just just some regular average folks that know how to do some home fix em ups or, or are connected to folks that know how to do home fix em ups, right? So they can kind of own property and take care of the house and so on and so forth. And they do probably, you know, either break even or turn a profit from this from this property. But let's say they get a, 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 a mortgage uh, cancellation that until the end of the pandemic, until it is absolutely safe for people to work and do all the things and yada, 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 uh, that there is no rent and mortgage. Uh, and, that is and that is compounded by the fact that the banks already got a $6 trillion bailout. They're, that already happened. So why do they need our money still? On top of this, there should be a debt moratorium. If you're in debt, it's part of that $6 trillion. Just cleared out your debt. Why am I still paying money to a bank that already has a fuck ton of money? Doesn't make any fucking sense, does it? So why did you guys give... So so really, that's the, that's the answer. You cancel the rents. People don't have to stress out about it. They still have shelter. You can stop the spread of... Uh, COVID-19, which which in the homeless community does spread pretty voraciously and quickly. 
because they don't have a way to protect themselves from this thing because they don't have shelter and they don't have access to clean water or food or 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 bathing or PPEs or any of that sort of stuff. This is unscientific to to still dish out eviction notices to people. Oh, I mean, going beyond the, the moral arguments of it, right? Because the hardcore capitalists and the Republicans and the conservatives, you know, those folks are going to sit there and make the argument that, oh, well, they fucked up in their lives. And if they can't afford their home, they can't afford their homes. Too bad. So sad. Go fuck yourself. This is, you know, you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps in the freest country in the world. This country is made great because of wage slavery. But cancel the it's it, it, cancel the rents is a organized movement. It's not something willy nilly. Like you can't just be like I cancel the rents and like it's not you're not Michael Scott from the office just yelling the word bankruptcy and now you've declared it right. Um, it's an organized way to push back against evictions during this pandemic. That means that if you live in a community, if you live in a, a you know in a in a in a apartment complex or apartment building or something like that, you all get together. And you push back against the landlord and say, "Look, we're we're not paying our rent. We're we're not paying any back rent. We're we're demanding that you cancel this rent. That's the only way to make this work. And whatever bank you have a loan with, they cancel your moratorium because they already got bailed out. It also advocates for the fact that housing is a human right. It's a human right." Which means that everybody that's unhoused, the fact that America and, and a lot of other countries have unhoused people on the street, a lot of whom have not made that choice for themselves, a lot of whom are homeless because of economic circumstances out of their control, that's a human rights violation. And right now, America is choosing to create its own homeless, like it always has, but now it's just doing it outright. Now it's just doing it in your face. And because it's organized, it, it shows that through solidarity and mutual aid, and there's a lot of mutual aid uh, groups and organizations that have started partnering with cancel the rent movements. You can take care of each other. People can actually thrive in a mutual aid community. It's about solidarity, not charity. It's about doing what's right for the community. It's about making sure that people are taken care of. Everybody is taken care of, not just people that fit a certain uh, you know, list of rules and regulations. Everybody gets taken care of. That's true equality. And that doesn't come from capitalism. That comes from ca so solidarity through socialism. Now, like I said, there's also people going hungry, and um, there was a food box program, a farm to kind of like a farm to table kind of program. Where I mean, my neighborhood did it, where where every week we would go and we would get some food. It would have produce, cheese, milk, uh, some meat, uh, fruits, vegetables, um, you know, sometimes bread. It had various different things, and it was basically stuff that that farms weren't able to send to wholesale retailers. Restaurants weren't getting in a, as much food, you know, from farmers anymore. Um, grocery stores were kind of in that same boat. So they were like, well, let's just give it directly to the people. Right. And, and they're, you know, so, so Trump created this program and now Biden's killing the program. He's getting rid of it. Why? Because, oh man, there were some places that had spoiled food and dairy products. Right. Some of the meat and, and dairy products went bad in some of these places or they had some transportation issues in some of these places. Uh, and oh, and then this is hilarious, too, is in certain cases, it was too expensive to keep the program going because corporations that the farmers had to use to deliver their the, the, the produce to these communities were overcharging them for distribution. They were overcharging the USDA. Now, the USDA's default was to tell these farmers to dump their food. So these farmers are still doing their jobs, and the USDA's direction was dump the milk and get rid of the food. 
So they're just throwing food away instead of feeding Americans. So eventually they started feeding Americans. And it was a program that was helping. I mean, we saw how many food lines there were across this country. So th th there's a routers piece that talks about this, right? And routers basically frames it as, oh, man, look how terrible Trump was at, uh, at giving food to Americans. Like some of the food got spoiled. These corporations... Can you believe that these corporations actually overcharged the USDA? Fucking yeah, because even Biden approved a bunch of the corporate loopholes that they're utilizing. There's no there's no regulation for them. And Biden championed that shit. Ah, let's do it. This is what happens in capitalism. This is what happens when capitalism runs a system. When you have assistance programs, they take advantage of it because capitalism is an opportunistic parasite. No fucking shit. This had, and yes, did, could Trump have done something better for it? Absolutely. But isn't, isn't Biden supposed to be the anti-Trump? He's supposed to be the antidote to all of Trumpism? Isn't that what the liberals tout? Isn't that what Democrats have been saying this whole fucking time? And instead of fixing the problem within the system, instead of fixing the logistical issues within the system, he's just going to get rid of it. Because it's more, quote, cost effective to throw all of it away than to pay somebody to distribute it and get it to, directly to the uh, homes of starving Americans. This system doesn't give a shit. Joe Biden doesn't give a shit because Joe Biden is an agent of capitalism. And he's more concerned about the bottom line than he is anything else. He's canceling the program, right? Biden decided to cancel food instead of cancel rents. That's what capitalism does. Which just means that it is possible to cancel rents. He can make that shit happen. But he just, there's just no political will to get it done. Because they want people in this situation. What What... I mean, this is a total and utter mismanagement of trying to take care of Americans and feed them. What these moratoriums do is that they delay it. They, it's a stopgap measure at best. That's what it is. There's an accumulation of rent. There's a back pay, and it puts people into debt. And that's how capitalism operates. It's a culture of debt. That's all it is. It's an economy based on debt. Everybody needs to be in some form of debt. That's how you have good credit, by the way. When you have a lot of debt that you are slowly paying off, where, where more of it is interest payments than it is actual principal payments, that means you have good credit. I paid off my student loans early, and I had a financial advisor once tell me that was a bad idea because my credit isn't going to go. It, it's not going to look good on my credit. When you have debt, you have good... How much sense does that actually fucking make? But capitalism thrives on it. That's why we invented... That's why it invented the credit system to begin with. So that it could increase the cost of shit. And regardless of what happens, everybody makes more money out of it. Except you, the consumer. Except you, the working class consumer. You get fucked over. And, and it's an exploitative thing, and it puts a price tag on every fucking thing that if you can't afford it, then you can get it on credit, be in debt forever, but you still get to enjoy that thing. And now they're doing it for food and shelter. They're doing it to basic fucking needs that should be guaranteed as a human being. Which means capitalism is, is violating human rights. Just by sh the sheer notion of its existence. Uh, I want to I want to um, get into this story, but I, I I know you guys have been leaving comments, so I want to take a look. I know Zozovix has left a couple comments. Uh, it says if if they paid people two k a month, this wouldn't be happening, which is why they didn't. You will own nothing and be happy being owned. Uh, so sixteen percent can't afford rent. That's uh, of 
adults 50 million directly, but at least 50 million indirectly counting children uh, as well. Could be looking at 50 million homeless. Yeah, ex absolutely. And and like you said, if they would have done $2,000 payments every month, this wouldn't be an issue because, uh, I mean, a good portion of that would have probably gone to paying rents depending on where you live. I live in Pittsburgh, so I would say about a quarter of that would have gone into paying rent for me, you know, but I know in other states it's probably uh, either all of it or most of it would be going to like New York City. It's most of it. San Diego is all of it. Um, and it is it is. We don't own anything. We're going to be in debt, you know, and what really sucks is if you're a family of four living in a two bedroom apartment. Well, that's it. I, that's that's where you live. If you want to keep a roof over your head and a roof for your children, then that is where you live forever. There's no expanding. There's no growing into a, a nest egg. You don't get to own property. It's either that or you or, or you do you do what those of was mentioning, 50 million homeless. Uh, banks will all buy up all that property for pennies on the dollar and sell it back to some government housing program. The indentured servitude of paying mortgages will begin anew in my lifetime. I've watched the cost of living quadruple. My father has watched it sextuple at least. Uh, people that say that are brainwashed. Uh, yeah, it's it. The cost. I mean, I've watched the cost of living go up. They were talking about it on NBC the other day, where they were like, "Oh, look at the cost of things going up. Isn't it crazy? What? Oh man, eggs. The eggs are costing like over a dollar fifty now, and bread is getting crazy. And a gallon of milk is more than a gallon of gas. That's so nuts. What's happening to the world? Oh, not mentioning the fact that." You know, minimum wage is the same. Uh, we haven't actually given economic relief to working class Americans in this country. They just ignore all that and they go, oh, man, isn't it nuts? What a crazy thing. Whoa, oh, man. Oh, that, boy, it's, it's sad. This is the producers are telling me it's sad. I'm an NBC reporter, so I actually don't know how to process my feelings un unless GE tells me how to process my feelings and what I'm supposed to feign to the American working class. The crux of the problem is the prices are going up while the cost of living has basically stayed the same, further put putting more Americans into poverty. Further creating a more, further exacerbating the housing crisis. Uh, okay, so I do want to read a portion of this article here. All right. So this is this is uh, Eleanor Goldfield is is writing this, and and we'll break we'll break this down as we kind of go along here. But I wanted to get to some comments before I did this part. Uh, she this is this uh, section is titled "A Morator Moratorium Full of Holes." Here's some I point to the eviction moratorium as proof that we uh, we have that at least we uh, sorry I don't know why I had a problem reading that sentence. Here's some I point to the eviction moratorium as proof that we at least have that covered. Allow me to unceremoniously burst your bubble. According to the tracking by the eviction lab at Princeton University during the pandemic, landlords have filed for over 284,490 eviction, and that's just in five states and 27 cities. But how could this be? After all, a moratorium shouldn't allow for hundreds of thousands of households to fall through the cracks. Well, let's just say that, quote, moratorium is a misnomer. This moratorium is more like a bottleneck on a freeway. It'll eventually let up, but things are just a little slowed down right now. What should have been a fierce and clear cut roadblock allows for landlords to evict tenants for reasons other than non-payment in places where leases have to be renewed by the landlord. They can just choose not to remove, re renew them. Furthermore, the burden lies on the tenant to provide the landlord with a CDC signed declaration that took me, a journalist, 10 minutes to find online when I already knew what I was looking for. At, at least we forget internet access is, is not a luxury every American can afford. So again, how many people, I, I'm, until I read this article, I didn't know about the CDC declaration. 
uh, and she and, and like she points out, it took her ten minutes to find, and she knew what she was looking for, and it still took her that long to find. Yeah, uh, and internet access is a luxury, it, uh, and it shouldn't be. A, it should be a, a basic need that's covered at this point. Uh, you know, which is why we need municipal broadband in a lot of cities, but. A, a lot of places don't have internet access. A lot of places could, you know, a lot of people can't afford internet access because even um, even if you lived in a, like in a household that maybe had their rents covered, their internet wasn't. I mean, Comcast was basically like, okay, you can't pay your rent next, you can't pay the bill this month. We'll do the same thing that we're doing with the rents. We'll just create a moratorium, and then you'll owe Comcast a buttload of money. Over 52 households earning less than $25,000 own and use a computer, and uh, as reported by Truthco, 78% of white, 68% of African Americans, and 66% of Latinos use the internet. In rural areas, however, only 70% of white Americans had adopted the internet compared to 59% of African Americans and 61% of Latinos. In other words, that online decoration form might as well be Willy Wonka's golden ticket. Indeed, just knowing that you need to fill out a declaration is a fact seemingly more well guarded than KFC's secret sauce recipe. I, I like the, I, I very much enjoy the way that Eleanor writes. Um, Age and gender also play a role here. When taken all together, the most marginalized people are the most at risk of being evicted simply because they don't have access to information about the measly protections available to them. And this goes for a lot of things, by the way. That's not just for rents. I mean, there's probably a lot of stuff that we can take protections for that we aren't even told about or isn't easily accessible. Or if it is, easy, if it is known about, is, is still kind of difficult to access. Landlords take advantage of this information gap and move forward with eviction proceedings, the trap into which thousands have fallen. After all, landlords can still file for eviction. Step two in the five-step process of eviction, notice, filing, hearing, court decision, and enforcement. So people see that the notice on their front door and thinks, think it's all over when in fact it's only just begun. That being said, many courthouses are moving forward with eviction proceedings in several states. Governors and state legislatures have effectively refused to pause evictions. So once you're in the process, you're in the process. I kind of knew about the five-step process. I knew that it was kind of a long process to go through. Um, but how many other people did? I didn't know the exact process until I read this article. So here, here's here's the other part of it, right? Check this. Out. So she says, for example, here in D.C., a superior court judge ruled back in December that legislation passed by the D.C. Council earlier this year banning landlords from filing eviction proceedings is unconstitutional and violates property owners' rights. So landlords are free to file away, leading to instances, as noted above, where people think they have to leave their homes in the midst of a pandemic. Fast forward to today, when the D.C. City Council voted to pass a bill that would allow landlords to evict tenants who pose a, quote, current and substantial threat to their neighbors, household members, and building slap, with housing advocates concerned that this will be used against any tenants that landlords want to get rid of, not uh, at least of all tenant organizers and those who have been able to pay rent. So basically, if you're one of these people that are on an evic, uh, uh, you know, kind of, in your homes because of an eviction moratorium, it doesn't matter. The landlord can choose not to renew your lease, which means that they can file an eviction notice anyway because they didn't renew a lease and you don't have a lease in the building now. Um, or they'll just file it anyway and the courts will take the side of the landlords. A lot of these rules are written so that the, it's it's weighted heavily to favor the landlords over the tenants in some of these cases. Um so, you know, the, the, them saying it's a current and substantial threat is just a, a circumvent way of saying, OK, there's an eviction moratorium, but we can say, oh, well, you know, this black family is uh, it, it's, they're, they're, they're threatening in their demeanor. And, and, you know, we just don't feel safe having them in the building or this Latino family seems to be too large for the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the apartment that they're in. There's there's f five or six of them in a two bedroom apartment. That's so crazy. Oh, my goodness. Which is ridiculous because 
when I was a kid, I lived in a one bedroom apartment in India with six people. And guess what? It wasn't like this unsanitary cesshole, cesspool, right? We weren't getting fucking diphtheria every week. Like, we knew how to fucking clean a house. And there were more hands involved. So it was actually cleaner than most houses. Like, we have a hard time. There's three of us living in this house. And we have a hard time keeping up with, with our jobs, right? Which, like, I have three of. Uh, uh, my housemate has a job and he, he has a, uh, uh, he's, he's a content producer as well. Uh, my other housemate has, has a, a job and, and takes care of this house on top of which she runs a, a radio network and is a, is a, a community organizer. She does a bunch of shit in the community. On top of that, we have to take care of this house. Do you know how hard that is? But if you have six people living there, there's other members of the family that can also help out. That's how a fucking community works. But that's not what they're trying to advocate for here. So they make the claims like, oh, this is a substantial threat because, oh, my God, they have more people living in a house or an apartment than than it, it legally, quote, legally says it should. Oh, it's a sanitation problem. No, it's not. It's really fucking not. So they're going to use this current and substantial threat to circumvent the eviction moratoriums to kick out people. And again, they'll probably use racial stereotypes in order to do that. And again, as we've seen from the the cases uh, involving killer cops, racism is is an accepted defense. You can use racial stereotypes as a defense to basically prove, you know, uh, to, to to validate injustices across the country. That is something that we've seen. So if it works in 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 a case uh, for a killer cop, there's no reason why it wouldn't work here. Um. So, going forward, so um, this bill put forward by council member Anita Bonds is backed by the city's rental housing strike force, a council put together by Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser to address tenant landlord issues that is suspiciously lacking in tenant voices, centering instead the voices and interests of landlords and developers. Ultimately, the bill passed with some amendments requiring for, for instance, the alternative housing to be secured in some cases prior to eviction, but housing advocates remain wary of the manifold opportunities for landlords to abuse this bill. Uh, cool. So, Moving forward, she talks about other states that are doing this, right? So D.C. is hardly alone uh, in its struggles against vague and weak moratoriums. In Idaho, tenants have tried to use the moratorium as a defense to have judges knock it down as invalid or insufficient. As the Idaho statement, statement statesman reported in late March, the Boise-based nonprofit Jesse Tree, which uh, Jesse Tree, which works with folks facing eviction, says they've seen the moratorium successfully used as a defense in not only one one case out of hundreds and that person was ultimately evicted anyway so i guess not all that successful in akron ohio a couple who are both battling stage four cancer was evicted by a zoom court proceedings because their their landlord sold property yet another glaring loophole in the moratorium a fellow akron resident didn't know uh, she had to bring that shifty CDC declaration to court, so her eviction proceeding went a a ahead as well. So again, that piece of paperwork is is in, like impeding people uh, from not getting evicted, from from having these these moratoriums, which when they work are just stopgap measures anyway, from actually working. And not just that, if you miss these court proceedings over Zoom, then you're you're double fucked anyway. And again, we go, we talked about how internet is a luxury in certain places. It, you can't afford internet. There's kids whose parents can't afford the internet. So they have to sit outside Starbucks and McDonald's to do their homework. And in the winter time or, or, or on a day like today, when it's raining outside, that's so, that's insanely difficult to do. This is, th this is affecting poor low income communities more than it is any other community. So they're using online evictions as a way to to get rid of people, right? Uh, I'm going to move to the next section here. 
Uh, and yet, these are just official court proceedings, as far more insidious beast lies in the informal eviction, a.k.a. illegal, a.k.a. self-help, which is what it's really called. Here in D.C., while landlords are allowed to move forward with the official filings, tenants are, for now, supposed, supposedly protected from being evicted until moratorium is lifted. Well, words like official and supposedly don't mean much when you come from a come to uh, come home to find that the landlord has changed the locks on your front door. Here again, landlords take advantage of the fact that so many of these low income tenants don't have access to information that would protect them from their landlord's illegal actions. Immigrant renters and those without immigration status are at particularly high risk, as many of them are afraid of retaliations uh, of uh, retaliation the likes of ICE if they asserted their rights. And again, I, that was something that we mentioned in the in the previous segment here of how immigrants are, are targeted at a higher rate because they need to be the model immigrant. If they're not the model immigrant, then they don't get to stick around in this country. They don't get to have a home. They don't get to do have a job and take care of their families and so on and so forth. So they exploit immigrants in, uh, in, in that sense. So again, they're doing it here. Uh, the eviction lab estimates that these informal evictions are twice as common as ofi official em evictions. And last June, the National Law Housing Pro Pro Project released a report that surveyed 100 legal aid and civil rights attorney in 38 states and found that 91% of them reported illegal evictions in the area, with 53% actually seeing tenants being illegally locked out of their homes by landlords. Other intimidation and eviction tactics include cutting off utility surface, refusing to make repairs, making threats, providing misinformation, and a slew of lease violation accusations, such as satellite dish or a partner who spends uh, the night more allotted for in the guest section of the lease. So they basically, if you have like a, you know, more guests in your home, they can say that it's a violation of your lease as well. Um by the way, the refusing to make repairs and providing misinformation, all of that is legal in New York City uh, because they do that for people who are rent controlled. Uh, and in order to get rid of their rent control status, they just go ahead and, and not do repairs. They make threats and they treat them like shit. So they have to leave and then they can like tune up the apartment a little bit and and then charge, you know, up the ass for it. So and so all this stuff during a pandemic just becomes even more legal to do anyway uh, and is and now is being used as a way to circumvent um, eviction moratoriums across the country. This is happening. Uh, OK, so this is I believe. Yeah, this is the last section that I want to read uh, on the flip side. Several media outlets have been quick to point out that the desperation many landlords are facing as they struggle to make ends meet themselves during the pandemic. It's true that there are many small scale, small scale landlords who say only own one property or rent out a basement of their home. But first of all, we all have to make the distinction between losing some income or losing your home. Secondly, a report by the C CBS Money Watch from late March of this year shows that landlords in general are doing fine, and in many cases, making big bucks off of the pandemic. For instance, Invitation Homes, the largest renter of single family residents in the country, made $50 million more last year than in 2019. Mid-America Apartment Communities, the owner of some 100,000 apartment units, saw skyrocket, profits skyrocket by 60% last year. At the same time, apartment owners are doing perhaps the best of any anyone in terms of staying up on their rent. January figures show that just 2.3% of apartment building owners uh, were behind on their rent compared with 19% of hotel and 13% of mall proprietors. They also have plenty of legal backing. 90% of landlords nationally have legal representation while only 10% of tenants do. So again, it becomes a money game because these guys can fucking afford a bunch of lawyers and us tenants who can barely pay our rents. How are we also going to start affording a lawyer? So when they go to these court hearings, they have to represent themselves. How are we supposed to afford a lawyer in that situation? And when it comes to arguing for the so-called mom-and-pop landlords, 
uh, Diane Yentl, president of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, points out that with the latest stimulus bill, Congress has now put billions into rental assistance with most of that money going straight to landlords. Meanwhile, you'd be hard pressed to find a renter who has come across any of those billions earmarked for rental assistance. Could it be that here again, we see the sadistic obstacle, uh, obstacle course of eligibility and accessibility issues combined with straight up systemic dumb shittery? Indeed we do. From state and local rollouts moving as slowly and as crookedly as molasses through a pinball machine to, to having to demonstrate a risk of homelessness. It's no wonder renters who need aid the most are not the ones getting it. And to be fair, even if they did some get some assistance now, what good will that do when the debts are called in after the moratorium? So like I said, this becomes a stopgap measure. So how are these people supposed to afford rents? How are these people supposed to keep up on all of these bills? It becomes, um, it, 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 it just becomes impossible because the debt becomes insurmountable. I'm kind of facing this version of this with my car payments where I might be able to catch up on it eventually, but probably not till the end of this year maybe even um, into like early next year, which is part of the reason why I keep thinking about touring. And, you know, like my margins were pretty low because I wouldn't get hotel rooms or eat out all the time. Like I, I would travel with my own groceries. I would either sleep in my car uh, or I would sleep on a friend's couch or couch surf or something like that. But all of that is not going to work out because I have a bunch of debts I need to take care of now. Thanks to the pandemic, there was a moratorium on the debts. There wasn't a cancellation of it, which means that my in in interest accrued and now I have to pay back against that. And when I argue that with the car company or, or I'm sorry, the bank, the, the bank that my, I, I have my car loaned out with, they just tell me this is the way that things are. Well, they fucking shouldn't be. And I kept and the reason why they were able to like start going like, OK, look. We can cancel out all of the late payments and we can do this, that, and third. And I knew that they could. I knew that there was some kind of plan in place for this. But the only reason why she did that is because I kept telling her that you're putting me in a financial trap. I, I yelled that shit into the phone until she <laughs> basically came up with the plan. Uh, like I scared her. But how many of these people know that, that you can do that kind of shit? How many of these people know that there's probably loopholes? There's probably aid that they can utilize. The rental assistance, the stimulus bill, all of that went back to corporations, went back to the banks, because guess what people paid off? Their credit card bills, their car payments, their mortgages, and their rents. Who, who made out in the end through that, quote, assistance that they put out there? It was the bankers and the landlords. So why are we not canceling the rents if they're making out big anyway? And, and they keep the minimum wage stagnant, so it doesn't matter how much, you know, a debt is accrued. Here's what I think we need to do with minimum wage, right? So the point of having a wage at all is to, is to be able to cover your basic needs, right? Is to work and be able to cover your basic needs. Well, one, we're shifting away from, uh, we're shifting away from that mentality of work. Uh, work shouldn't just be something you do to cover your basic needs. I think the mentality of that is starting to shift and, and we're starting to push back, right? That's why we saw uh, over 3,000 strikes last year. That's why we see, uh, be, you know, the, there, there's a fight to unionize uh, with an Amazon. Labor is going to be a crucial focal point to this. So wages need to cover all of our basic needs. If, if we're going to say that we're, we're going to run off the wage model here, right? That's shelter, food, internet, bills, that sort of stuff. And then you need to get, and then on top of that, it should also be able to have an additional 25% that people can put into their savings for a rainy day if something crazy happens. Right now, people can't afford a $400 emergency. So people should be able to afford emergencies when that happens. So a, a minimum wage or, or wages period should involve something where people can put money away. And then on top of that, they should have 30% of, uh, of something for, you know, recreational activities so that they can actually enjoy their lives so that work doesn't become this drudgery for just covering basic needs. And not just that, minimum wage should be the maximum cost of living in the most expensive city in the country. 
for example, that would be San Diego, right? Uh, give you an example to make sense of this thing. Uh, on average, I, this number is probably not 100% accurate, um, but let's go with it for the sake of the argument. Uh, based on something that I looked up, on average, you're looking at a cost of living in San Diego being about $2,000 a month. $2,000 a month in San Diego. Um, which means that if you want minimum wage to reflect the cost of living based on the maximum cost of living in the country, we should be getting paid $21 an hour. It's roughly three times the amount of, that we're making now, which means that San Diego, anybody getting minimum wage in San Diego is making a third of what they actually need to live if they're working full time, which in a lot of cases, when you're working a minimum wage job, you're not working full time. So explain to me the mathematics of how these people, in certain cases, making one third or less of what they need to to meet their cost of living, are now going to pay back five, six, seven, eight months worth of back pay of their cost of living. This is not just an insult to science, considering the fact that creating more homeless people is going to create a new wave of this pandemic, which means that the more the virus is out there, the more it will mutate and create more variants that are not effective, uh, that, 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 that the vaccines are not going to protect, that are probably going to get crazier. So you're going against science with these evictions, but now you're also going to, against mathematics. So for an administration that says they're going to lead by science and lead by empathy, you're showing neither one. In fact, you're looking at the STEM industry, the science, technology, engineering, and math industry, and just making it the t, -t industry. But even then, I bet that you'll, <laughs> you'll bail on the technology and engineering side of things pretty darn quick. Let's look at some comments. Uh, Jay Jackson says, uh, RE Capitalism, what strikes me is how many American citizens think that this is how it is uh, supposed to be. They literally cannot conceive any other way. That's largely the media's fault, but uh, religion and pop culture drive it also. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's it's impossible for me to like watch a movie or watch a show and not pick out like, up. Oh, there's some pro-capitalist rhetoric right there. Oh, there's that CIA narrative. Oh, there's that DNC narrative that's thrown in there a little bit. You know, um, it, it, it does get hard to, to, to decipher. But what's interesting, like, and, and Jay has a, a great podcast called The Sacred Now where, where he talks about religion and pop culture um, and covers a, a, a wide variety of issues, uh, you know, current, current issues that we're seeing in our country. But Jay talks about pop culture a lot, and what's interesting is when you, when the closer you get to the source material, when it's when it's pertaining to comic books um, and sci-fi, the closer you get to the source material, the less you hear those narratives, right? Because in comic books, the art mirrors what's happening in real life, right? So the closer you get to that source material, the closer you actually get to some sub subversive content. Which is which I find to be interesting. The further you deviate from it, the more it ends up being like, okay, we can hear the CIA talking points in this situation. We can, you know, like, like the, people get a little upset when whenever it's like, oh, they overdeveloped the villain, like they quote overdeveloped the villain. It's like, no, oh, good. Let's let's see some gray area and let's see how the heroes deal with it because those are the comic book stories that are the most interesting to me. Those are the comic book uh, uh, stories and and sci-fi stories that are the the most realistic to me and the most intellectually engaging and the mo more fun too they're you know they're the more fun to me but they don't they don't know that and and yet you're right the media is largely responsible for it you know like like we talked about how routers was was framing it as oh man trump was feeding americans Pff, look at what what a shit job he did but instead of trying to fix the system and, and learn from our mistake, we're just going to get rid of it and keep dumping food while Americans go hungry. And people go, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's the economy, man. You know, you got to think about you got to think about the stock market in the situation. Like, who gives a shit about the stock market? Feed people. Hopping over to Rockfan. 
Zozovix, let me find your let me find your uh, your comment that to start this segment here. Okay, uh, Zozovix says there is one truth as far as the credit comment goes uh, about keeping a running line of debt. Once you get a bank hooked on you, like Trump, if your debt is so substantial that the bank can't afford to just take back all of your property and liquidate it, then you have uh, beaten the bank at its own game. <laughs> Uh, they actually fear that you will claim bankruptcy and bend over backwards to keep the payments coming in. Uh, but that's uh, a privilege that only the richest, the richest can enjoy. Yeah, this, you, you know, a lot of people have told me about, uh, you know, property laws and, and all that kind of stuff. And the more I read about them, you, your, your last statement kind of covers it is it's not meant for you and me. Right. It's not meant for it's not meant for the average person to know. So it's. Yeah, keep yourself in debt. You're supposed to have some debt. You're you you're not supposed to completely pay off this thing. Uh, you know, like I was thinking about it the the uh, the other week of of like, okay, if I got the stimulus, which I'm not eligible to get any of the stimulus, so the twelve hundred, the six hundred, and the fourteen hundred that came in, I I was one of the people that fell through the cracks and just couldn't get it. Um, well, what would I have done if I had gotten twenty two hundred dollars? Right. I would have been able to get rid of the credit card debt I had. I would have probably been able to get rid of uh, a very old tax debt that I am still paying off. And I would have been able to maybe put a little bit more of a dent into um, into my car payment and, and started to work myself out of some debt, which would have meant that I could have probably, uh, you know, taken this year to like I'm doing to get a second part time job, put put a little cash into the savings and next year, try to logistically figure out what touring is going to look like in a in in a in a COVID environment. You know, I don't. I, that's a possibility. Again, like I said, the way that I kind of uh, traveled on a dime was I didn't afford a hotel, and now it looks like you know I would have to. Couch surfing might not be a possibility. Staying with comedians and and random strangers might not be a possibility in this environment. They, not just because I might not be comfortable, but they might not be comfortable having me in their homes. You know, it's made things more difficult. But had my debt been less, I might have been able to move the timetable up a little bit more. There's a lot of financial roadblocks for to, to get me back out on the road. So, you know, but that's the point of it. That's the point of keeping people in debt. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, a, a source of control for them. And that's exactly what's going to happen in this situation. There's going to be a bunch of back rent that people are going to have to pay, and they're going to be controlled by, you know, by the landlords, by the banking industry. Oh, uh, Georgia Vicks just left another comment. Jimmy Dore said yesterday that he's getting the COVID shot and going on tours again in like a month. But Jimmy has a lot more uh, money than I do and a, and a much larger fan base. Jimmy sells out theaters. I do house shows. <laughs> Uh, so that's the major difference there. Uh, previously, he was going to wait another year. Yeah, Ron Placone and Lee Camp and I have been talking a lot about when touring might be able to kick back up and, and you know, to, to kind of look at the logistics. We're not trying to get rich and famous off of doing it, but just make sure that we're not in the red. If we can pay our bills, pay gas, put food on our table, then we're good. And before the pandemic, I was doing that pretty regularly. Uh, and so was Lee. I mean, Lee's been doing that for years, but Jimmy, Jimmy's kind of in a, in a whole nother tier. I would love to be in Jimmy's tier uh, where I would be able to sell out some theaters or, a, a, and stuff like that. But even then I probably, you, you know, and this is sort of a, 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 a way aside here. Um, but I, I don't know if I was at Jimmy's level, you know, my, me personally, and this is, I'm, I'm not saying that Jimmy's doing the wrong thing or anything. Jimmy's doing what's right for him. What's right for me is I probably wouldn't do a big theater or something. I would probably do like a hundred seater max if I was at Jimmy's level. And I would probably sell, you know, I would do like two or three shows in one city at a time. Um, because I think the hundred seaters are more fun and more intimate when you're in a theater, there's there's a little bit of a distance from the crowd, uh, and and that level of intimacy and personal connection is um, is missed. I I find it more fun when the audience 
not all the time, but you know, sometimes it's it's more fun to play off of the crowd's energy and reactions. And in a smaller room, it's more fun to do than in a, in a larger room because you know somebody might made a little reaction to the left, and you saw it, and a couple other people saw it, but you know the people sitting five or six rows back might have not might not know what's going on. So I, I find the smaller venues to be more fun. And if I was at Jimmy's level, I would probably be looking at continuing to do some of the more intimate venues. That's a way further aside um, than <laughs> I intended on getting. I would love to be back on the road. I would love to. Uh, I, I miss it every fucking day. There's a, there's a, a part of me that, you know, there's a hole in my heart uh, that, that uh, can only be filled by touring, but you got to make the best of the situation that you're in and, and fight for the situation that you want. Uh, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. So I'm going to try to continue doing that in the best way that I can. So uh, I also have to get my, my physical and mental health back in, back in shape as well. Uh, cause I'm, I'm, you know, getting into my thirties here and being on the road the way that I was, uh, in, in 2019, 2018 and 2019 is not going to be feasible going forward. So I have to figure out how to make that more sustainable, both, uh, economically for me, uh, but also like in a physical and mental health term. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, cause boy, do I fucking miss touring. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, um, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content you can go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video. Thanks again.